Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor Preface, Introduction and Letter Preface I have been asked many times by my friends and also by members of the Grand Army of the Republic and Women's Relief Corps to write a book of my army life during the war of 1861 to 65 with the regiment of the 1st South Carolina Colored Troops, later called 33rd United States Colored Infantry. At first I did not think I would, but as the years rolled on and my friends were still urging me to start with it, I wrote to Colonel C.T. Trowbridge, who had command of this regiment, asking his opinion and advice on the matter. His answer to me was, Go ahead, write it. That is just what I should do, were I in your place, and I will give you all the assistance you may need, whenever you require it. This inspired me very much. In 1900 I received a letter from a gentleman, sent from the executive mansion at St. Paul, Minnesota, saying Colonel Trowbridge had told him I was about to write a book and when it was published, he wanted one of the first copies. This, coming from a total stranger, gave me more confidence, so I now present these reminiscences to you, hoping they may prove of some interest, and show how much service and good we can do to each other, and what sacrifices we can make for our liberty and rights, and that there were loyal women, as well as men, in those days, who did not fear shell or shot, who cared for the sick and dying, women who camped and fared as the boys did, and who are still caring for the comrades in their declining years. So, with the hope that the following pages will accomplish some good and instruction for its readers, I shall proceed with my narrative. Susie King Taylor Boston, 1902 Introduction Actual military life is rarely described by a woman, and this is especially true of a woman whose place was in the ranks as the wife of a soldier and herself a regimental laundress. No such description has ever been given, I am sure, by one thus connected with a coloured regiment so that the nearly 200,000 black soldiers, 178,975, of our civil war, have never before been delineated from the woman's point of view. All this gives peculiar interest to this little volume, relating wholly to the career of the very earliest of these regiments. The one described by myself, from a wholly different point of view, in my volume, Army Life in a Black Regiment, long since translated into French by the Comtesse de Gosperon under the title Vie Militaire dans un Regiment Noir. The writer of this present book was very exceptional among the coloured laundresses, in that she could read and write and had taught children to do the same and her whole life and career were most estimable, both during the war and in the later period during which she has lived in Boston and has made many friends. I may add that I did not see the book until the sheets were in print and have left it wholly untouched, except as to a few errors in proper names. I commend the narrative to those who love the plain record of simple lives, led in stormy periods. Thomas Wentworth Higginson, former Colonel, 1st South Carolina Volunteers, afterwards 33rd U.S. Colored Infantry, Cambridge, Massachusetts, November 3rd, 1902. Letter from Colonel C.T. Trowbridge, St. Paul, Minnesota, April 7th, 1902. Mrs. Susan King Taylor, Dear Madam, The manuscript of the story of your army life reached me today. 
I have read it with much care and interest, and I most willingly and cordially endorse it as a truthful account of your unselfish devotion and service through more than three long years of war in which the 33rd Regiment bore a conspicuous part in the great conflict for human liberty and the restoration of the Union. I most sincerely regret that through a technicality you are debarred from having your name placed on the roll of pensioners as an army nurse, for among all the number of heroic women whom the government is now rewarding, I know of no one more deserving than yourself. Yours in fraternity, charity and loyalty, C.T. Trowbridge, late Lieutenant Colonel, 33rd United States Colored Troops. End of section zero. Section one of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. A brief sketch of my ancestors. My great great grandmother was 120 years old when she died. She had seven children and five of her boys were in the Revolutionary War. She was from Virginia and was half Indian. She was so old, she had to be held in the sun to help restore or prolong her vitality. My great-grandmother, one of her daughters, named Susanna, was married to Peter Simons, and was 100 years old when she died from a stroke of paralysis in Savannah. She was the mother of 24 children, 23 being girls. She was one of the noted midwives of her day. In 1820, my grandmother was born and named after her grandmother, Dolly. And in 1833, she married Fortune Lambert Reed. Two children blessed their union, James and Hagar Ann. James died at the age of 12 years. My mother was born in 1834. She married Raymond Baker in 1847. Nine children were born to them, three dying in infancy. I was the first born. I was born on the Grest Farm, which was on an island known as Isle of Wight, Liberty County, about 35 miles from Savannah, Georgia, on August 6th, 1848 my mother being waitress for the Grest family. I have often been told by my mother of the care Mrs. Grest took of me. She was very fond of me, and I remember when my brother and I were small children, and Mr. Grest would go away on business, Mrs. Grest would place us at the foot of her bed to sleep and keep her company. Sometimes he would return home earlier than he had expected to. Then she would put us on the floor. When I was about seven years old, Mr. Grest allowed my grandmother to take my brother and me to live with her in Savannah. There were no railroad connections in those days between this place and Savannah. All was travel by stagecoaches. I remember, as if it were yesterday, the coach which ran in from Savannah with its driver, whose beard nearly reached his knees. His name was Shakespeare, and often I would go to the stable where he kept his horses, on Barnard Street, in front of the old arsenal, just to look at his wonderful beard. My grandmother went every three months to see my mother. She would hire a wagon to carry bacon, tobacco, flour, molasses, and sugar. These she would trade with people in the neighboring places, for eggs, chickens, or cash, if they had it. These, in turn, she carried back to the city market, where she had a customer who sold them for her. The profit from these, together with laundry work and care of some bachelor's rooms, made a good living for her. The hardest blow to her was the failure of the Freedmen's Savings Bank in Savannah, for in that bank she had placed her savings, about $3,000, the result of her hard labor and self-denial before the war, and which, by dint of shrewdness and care, she kept together all through the war. She felt it more keenly 
coming as it did in her old age, when her life was too far spent to begin anew. But she took a practical view of the matter, for she said, I will leave it all in God's hand. If the Yankees did take all our money, they freed my race. God will take care of us. In 1888, she wrote me here, Boston, asking me to visit her, as she was getting very feeble and wanted to see me once before she passed away. I made up my mind to leave at once, but about the time I planned to go, in March, a fearful blizzard swept our country, and travel was at a standstill for nearly two weeks. But March 15th, I left on the first through steamer from New York, en route for the south, where I again saw my grandmother, and we felt thankful that we were spared to meet each other once more. This was the last time I saw her, for in May, 1889, she died. End of section one. Section two of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. My childhood. I was born under the slave law in Georgia in 1848 and was brought up by my grandmother in Savannah. There were three of us with her, my younger sister and brother. My brother and I, being the two eldest, we were sent to a friend of my grandmother, Mrs. Woodhouse, a widow, to learn to read and write. She was a free woman and lived on Bay Lane, between Habersham and Price Streets, about half a mile from my house. We went every day about nine o'clock, with our books wrapped in paper to prevent the police or white persons from seeing them. We went in, one at a time, through the gate, into the yard to the L kitchen, which was the schoolroom. She had twenty-five or thirty children whom she taught, assisted by her daughter, Mary Jane. The neighbors would see us going in sometimes, but they supposed we were there learning trades, as it was the custom to give children a trade of some kind. After school we left the same way we entered, one by one, when we would go to a square, about a block from the school, and wait for each other. We would gather laurel leaves and pop them on our hands, on our way home. I remained at her school for two years or more, when I was sent to a Mrs. Mary Beasley, where I continued until May, 1860, when she told my grandmother she had taught me all she knew, and grandmother had better get someone else who could teach me more, so I stopped my studies for a while. I had a white playmate about this time, named Kitty O'Connor, who lived on the next corner of the street from my house, and who attended a convent. One day she told me, if I would promise not to tell her father, she would give me some lessons. On my promise not to do so, and getting her mother's consent, she gave me lessons about four months, every evening. At the end of this time she was put into the convent permanently, and I have never seen her since. A month after this, James Bloys, our landlord's son, was attending the high school, and was very fond of grandmother, so she asked him to give me a few lessons, which he did until the middle of 1861, when the Savannah Volunteer Guards, to which he and his brother belonged, were ordered to the front under General Barton. In the first battle of Manassas, his brother Eugene was killed, and James deserted over to the Union side, and at the close of the war went to Washington, D.C., where he has since resided. I often wrote passes for my grandmother, for all colored persons, free or slaves, were compelled to have a pass. Free colored people having a guardian in place of a master. These passes were good until 10 or 10.30 p.m., for one night, or every night, for one month. The pass read as follows. Savannah, Georgia, March 1st, 1860. Pass the bearer, blank, from 9 to 10.30 p.m. Valentine Grest. Every person had to have this pass, 
for at nine o'clock every night a bell was rung, and any coloured persons found on the street after this hour were arrested by the watchman and put in the guardhouse until next morning, when their owners would pay their fines and release them. I knew a number of persons who went out at any time of night and were never arrested, as the watchman knew them so well he never stopped them and seldom asked to see their passes, only stopping them long enough, sometimes, to say, howdy, and then telling them to go along. About this time I had been reading so much about the Yankees, I was very anxious to see them. The whites would tell their colored people not to go to the Yankees, for they would harness them to carts and make them pull the carts around, in place of horses. I asked grandmother, one day, if this was true. She replied, Certainly not, but the white people did not want slaves to go over to the Yankees, and told them these things to frighten them. Don't you see those signs pasted about the streets? One reading, I am a rattlesnake, if you touch me I will strike. Another reads, I am a wild cat, beware, etc. These are warnings to the north, so don't mind what the white people say. I wanted to see these wonderful Yankees so much, as I heard my parents say the Yankee was going to set all the slaves free. Oh, how those people prayed for freedom! I remember, one night, my grandmother went out into the suburbs of the city to a church meeting, and they were fervently singing this old hymn. Yes, we all shall be free. Yes, we all shall be free. Yes, we all shall be free when the Lord shall appear. When the police came in and arrested all who were there, saying they were planning freedom and sang the Lord in place of Yankee to blind anyone who might be listening. Grandmother never forgot that night although she did not stay in the guardhouse, as she sent to her guardian, who came at once for her, but this was the last meeting she ever attended out of the city proper. On April 1st, 1862, about the time the Union soldiers were firing on Fort Pulaski, I was sent out into the country to my mother. I remember what a roar and din the guns made. They jarred the earth for miles. The fort was at last taken by them. Two days after the taking of Fort Pulaski, my uncle took his family of seven and myself to St. Catherine Island. We landed under the protection of the Union fleet and remained there two weeks when about 30 of us were taken aboard the gunboat P to be transferred to St. Simon's Island. And at last, to my unbounded joy, I saw the Yankee. After we were all settled aboard and started on our journey, Captain Whitmore, commanding the boat, asked me where I was from. I told him Savannah, Georgia. He asked if I could read. I said, yes. Can you write? He next asked. Yes, I can do that also, I replied and as if he had some doubts of my answers, he handed me a book and a pencil and told me to write my name and where I was from. I did this when he wanted to know if I could sew. On hearing I could, he asked me to hem some napkins for him. He was surprised at my accomplishments, for they were such in those days, for he said he did not know there were any Negroes in the South able to read or write. He said, you seem to be so different from the other colored people who came from the same place you did. No, I replied. The only difference is they were reared in the country and I in the city, as was a man from Darien, Georgia, named Edward King. That seemed to satisfy him, and we had no further conversation that day on the subject. In the afternoon, the captain spied a boat in the distance and as it drew nearer, he noticed it had a white flag hoisted. But before it had reached the Putimoka, he ordered all passengers between decks, so we could not be seen, for he thought they might be spies. The boat finally drew alongside of our boat, 
and had Mr. Edward Donegal on board, who wanted his two servants, Nick and Judith. He wanted them, as they were his own children. Our captain told him he knew nothing of them, which was true, for at the time they were on St. Simon's, and not, as their father supposed, on our boat. After the boat left, we were allowed to come up on deck again. End of section two. Section three of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. On St. Simon's Island, 1862. Next morning we arrived at St. Simon's and the captain told Commodore Goldsborough about this affair and his reply was, Captain Whitmore, you should not have allowed them to return, you should have kept them. After I had been on St. Simon's about three days, Commodore Goldsborough heard of me and came to Gaston Bluff to see me. I found him very cordial. He said Captain Whitmore had spoken to him of me and that he was pleased to hear of my being so capable, etc and wished me to take charge of a school for the children on the island. I told him I would gladly do so, if I could have some books. He said I should have them, and in a week or two, I received two large boxes of books and testaments from the north. I had about 40 children to teach, beside a number of adults who came to me nights, all of them so eager to learn to read, to read above anything else. Chaplain French, of Boston, would come to the school, sometimes, and lecture to the pupils on Boston and the North. About the 1st of June, we were told that there was going to be a settlement of the war. Those who were on the Union side would remain free, and those in bondage were to work three days for their masters, and three for themselves. It was a gloomy time for us all, and we were to be sent to Liberia. Chaplain French asked me would I rather go back to Savannah or go to Liberia. I told him the latter place by all means. We did not know when this would be, but we were prepared in case this settlement should be reached. However, the Confederates would not agree to the arrangement, or else it was one of the many rumors flying about at the time as we heard nothing further of the matter. There were a number of settlements on this island of St. Simon's, just like little villages, and we would go from one to the other on business, to call, or only for a walk. One Sunday, two men, Adam Miller and Daniel Spaulding, were chased by some rebels as they were coming from Hope Place, which was between the beach and Gaston Bluff but the latter were unable to catch them. When they reached the beach and told this, all the men on the place, about 90, armed themselves, and next day, Monday, with Charles O'Neill as their leader, skirmished the island for the Rebs. In a short while they discovered them in the woods, hidden behind a large log among the thick underbrush. Charles O'Neill was the first to see them, and he was killed. Also, John Brown, and their bodies were never found. Charles O'Neill was an uncle of Edward King, who later was my husband, and a sergeant in Company E, United States Infantry. Another man was shot, but not found for three days. On Tuesday, the second day, Captain Trowbridge and some soldiers landed, and assisted the skirmishers. Word having been sent by the mailboat Uncas to Hilton Head, later in the day Commodore Goldsborough, who was in command of the naval station, landed about 300 marines, and joined the others to oust the rebels. On Wednesday, John Baker, the man shot on Monday, was found in a terrible condition by Henry Batchelot, who carried him to the beach, where he was attended by the surgeon. He told us how, after being shot, he lay quiet for a day. On the second day, he managed to reach some wild grapes growing near him. These he ate, 
to satisfy his hunger and intense thirst. Then he crawled slowly, every movement causing agony, until he got to the side of the road. He lived only three months after they found him. On the second day of the skirmish, the troops captured a boat which they knew the Confederates had used to land in, and having this in their possession, the Rebs could not return, so pickets were stationed all around the island. There was an old man, Henry Capers, who had been left on one of the places by his old master, Mr. Hazard, as he was too old to carry away. These rebels went to his house in the night, and he hid them up in the loft. On Tuesday all hands went to this man's house, with a determination to burn it down, but Henry Batchelot pleaded with the men to spare it. The rebels were in hiding, still, waiting a chance to get off the island. They searched his house, but neglected to go up into the loft and in so doing missed the rebels concealed there. Late in the night, Henry Capers gave them his boat to escape in, and they got off all right. This old man was allowed by the men in charge of the island to cut grass for his horse, and to have a boat to carry this grass to his home, and so they were not detected, our men thinking it was Capers using the boat. After Commodore Goldsborough left the island, Commodore Juden sent the old man over to the mainland and would not allow him to remain on the island. There were about 600 men, women and children on St. Simons, the women and children being in the majority, and we were afraid to go very far from our own quarters in the daytime, and at night even to go out of the house for a long time although the men were on the watch all the time, for there were not any soldiers on the island, only the marines who were on the gunboats along the coast. The rebels, knowing this, could steal by them under cover of the night, and getting on the island, would capture any persons venturing out alone, and carry them to the mainland. Several of the men disappeared, and as they were never heard from, we came to the conclusion they had been carried off in this way. The latter part of August, 1862, Captain C.T. Trowbridge, with his brother John and Lieutenant Walker, came to St. Simon's Island from Hilton Head, by order of General Hunter, to get all the men possible to finish filling his regiment, which he had organized in March, 1862. He had heard of the skirmish on this island, and was very much pleased at the bravery shown by these men. He found me at Gaston Bluff teaching my little school, and was much interested in it. When I knew him better, I found him to be a thorough gentleman, and a staunch friend to my race. Captain Trowbridge remained with us until October, when the order was received to evacuate. And so we boarded the Ben de Ford, a transport, for Beaufort, South Carolina. When we arrived in Beaufort, Captain Trowbridge and the men he had enlisted went to camp at Old Fort, which they named Camp Saxton. I was enrolled as laundress. The first suits worn by the boys were red coats and pants, which they disliked very much, for, they said, the rebels see us, miles away. The first coloured troops did not receive any pay for eighteen months, and the men had to depend wholly on what they received from the commissary, established by General Saxton. A great many of these men had large families, and as they had no money to give them, their wives were obliged to support themselves and children by washing for the officers of the gunboats and the soldiers, and making cakes and pies which they sold to the boys in camp. Finally, in 1863, the government decided to give them half pay, but the men would not accept this. They wanted full pay, or nothing. They preferred rather to give their services to the state, which they did until 1864, when the government granted them full pay, with all the back pay due. 
i remember captain heasley telling his company one day boys stand up for your full pay i am with you and so are all the officers this captain was from pennsylvania and was a very good man and all the men liked him n g parker our first lieutenant was from massachusetts h a beach was from new york he was very delicate and had to resign in 1864 on account of ill health i had a number of relatives in this regiment several uncles some cousins and a husband in company e and a number of cousins in other companies major strong of this regiment started home on a furlough but the vessel he was aboard was lost and he never reached his home he was one of the best officers we had after his death captain c t trowbridge was promoted major august 1863 and filled major strong's place until december 1864 when he was promoted lieutenant colonel which he remained until he was mustered out february 6 1866 in february 1863 several cases of varioloid broke out among the boys which caused some anxiety in camp edward davis of company e the company i was with had it very badly he was put into a tent apart from the rest of the men and only the doctor and camp steward james cummings were allowed to see or attend him but i went to see this man every day and nursed him the last thing at night i always went in to see that he was comfortable but in spite of the good care and attention he received he succumbed to the disease i was not in the least afraid of the smallpox i had been vaccinated and i drank sassafras tea constantly which kept my blood purged and prevented me from contracting this dread scourge and no one need fear getting it if they will only keep their blood in good condition with this sassafras tea and take it before going where the patient is end of section three section four of reminiscences by susie king taylor camp saxton proclamation and barbecue 1863 on the first of january 1863 we held services for the purpose of listening to the reading of president lincoln's proclamation by dr w h brisbane and the presentation of two beautiful stands of color one from a lady in connecticut and the other from reverend mr cheever the presentation speech was made by chaplain french it was a glorious day for us all and we enjoyed every minute of it and as a fitting close and the crowning event of this occasion we had a grand barbecue a number of oxen were roasted whole and we had a fine feast although not served as tastily or correctly as it would have been at home yet it was enjoyed with keen appetites and relish the soldiers had a good time they sang or shouted hurrah all through the camp and seemed overflowing with fun and frolic until taps were sounded when many no doubt dreamt of this memorable day i had rather an amusing experience that is it seems amusing now as i look back but at the time it occurred it was a most serious one to me when our regiment left beaufort for seabrook i left some of my things with a neighbor who lived outside of the camp after i had been at seabrook about a week i decided to return to camp saxton and get them so one morning with mary shaw a friend who was in the company at that time i started off there was no way for us to get to Beaufort other than to walk, except we rode on the commissary wagon. This we did, and reached Beaufort about one o'clock. We then had more than two miles to walk before reaching our old camp, 
and expected to be able to accomplish this and return in time to meet the wagon again by three o'clock that afternoon and so be taken back we failed to do this however for when we got to beaufort the wagon was gone we did not know what to do i did not wish to remain overnight neither did my friend although we might easily have stayed as both had relatives in the town it was in the springtime and the days were long and as the sun looked so bright we concluded to walk back thinking we should reach camp before dark so off we started on our ten mile tramp we had not gone many miles however before we were all tired out and began to regret our undertaking the sun was getting low and we grew more frightened fearful of meeting some animal or of treading on a snake on our way we did not meet a person and we were frightened almost to death our feet were so sore we could hardly walk finally we took off our shoes and tried walking in our stocking feet but this made them worse we had gone about six miles when night overtook us there we were nothing around us but dense woods and as there was no house or any place to stop at there was nothing for us to do but continue on we were afraid to speak to each other meantime at the camp seeing no signs of us by dusk they concluded we had decided to remain over until next day and so had no idea of our plight imagine their surprise when we reached camp about 11 p.m the guard challenged us who comes there my answer was a friend without a countersign he approached and saw who it was reported and we were admitted into the lines they had the joke on us that night and for a long time after would tease us and sometimes some of the men who were on guard that night would call us deserters they used to laugh at us but we joined with them too especially when we would tell them our experience on our way to camp i did not undertake that trip again as there was no way of getting in or out except one took the provision wagon and there was not much dependence to be put in that returning to camp perhaps the driver would say one hour and he might be there earlier or later of course it was not his fault as it depended when the order was filled at the commissary department therefore i did not go any more until the regiment was ordered to our new camp which was named after our hero colonel shaw who at that time was at beaufort with his regiment the 54th massachusetts i taught a great many of the comrades in company e to read and write when they were off duty nearly all were anxious to learn my husband taught some also when it was convenient for him i was very happy to know my efforts were successful in camp and also felt grateful for the appreciation of my services i gave my services willingly for four years and three months without receiving a dollar i was glad however to be allowed to go with the regiment to care for the sick and afflicted comrades. End of section four. Section five of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. Military Expeditions and Life in Camp. In the latter part of 1862, the regiment made an expedition into Darien. Georgia and up the ridge and on January 23rd 1863 another up St. Mary's River capturing a number of stores for the government then on to Fernandina Florida they were gone 10 or 12 days at the end of which time they returned to camp March 10th 1863 we were ordered to Jacksonville Florida Leaving Camp Saxton between four and five o'clock, we arrived at Jacksonville about eight o'clock next morning, accompanied by three or four gunboats. 
When the rebels saw these boats, they ran out of the city, leaving the women behind, and we found out afterwards that they thought we had a much larger fleet than we really had. Our regiment was kept out of sight until we made fast at the wharf where it landed, and while the gunboats were shelling up the river, and as far inland as possible, the regiment landed and marched up the street, where they spied the rebels who had fled from the city. They were hiding behind a house about a mile or so away, their faces blackened to disguise themselves as negroes, and our boys, as they advanced toward them, halted a second, saying, They are black men. Let them come to us, or we will make them know who we are. With this, the firing was opened, and several of our men were wounded and killed. The rebels had a number wounded and killed. It was through this way the discovery was made that they were white men. Our men drove them some distance in retreat, and then threw out their pickets. While the fighting was on, a friend, Lizzie Lancaster, and I stopped at several of the rebel homes, and after talking with some of the women and children, we asked them if they had any food. They claimed to have only some hard tack, and evidently did not care to give us anything to eat. But this was not surprising. They were bitterly against our people, and had no mercy or sympathy for us. The second day, our boys were reinforced by a regiment of white soldiers, a main regiment, and by cavalry, and had quite a fight. On the third day, Edward Heron, who was a fine gunner on the steamer John Adams, came on shore, bringing a small cannon, which the men pulled along for more than five miles. This cannon was the only piece for shelling. On coming upon the enemy, all secured their places, and they had a lively fight, which lasted several hours, and our boys were nearly captured by the Confederates. But the Union boys carried out all their plans that day, and succeeded in driving the enemy back. After this skirmish, every afternoon between four and five o'clock, the Confederate General Finnegan would send a flag of truce to Colonel Higginson, warning him to send all women and children out of the city, and threatening to bombard it if this was not done. Our Colonel allowed all to go who wished, at first, but as General Finnegan grew more hostile, and kept sending these communications for nearly a week, Colonel Higginson thought it not best or necessary to send any more out of the city, and so informed General Finnegan. This angered the General, for that night the rebels shelled directly towards Colonel Higginson's headquarters. The shelling was so heavy that the Colonel told my captain to have me taken up into the town to a hotel, which was used as a hospital. As my quarters were just in the rear of the Colonel's, he was compelled to leave his also before the night was over. I expected every moment to be killed by a shell, but on arriving at the hospital, I knew I was safe, for the shells could not reach us there. It was plainly to be seen now, the ruse of the flag of truce coming so often to us. The bearer was evidently a spy, getting the location of the headquarters, etc., for the shells were sent too accurately to be at random. Next morning, Colonel Higginson took the cavalry and a regiment on another tramp after the rebels. They were gone several days and had the hardest fight they had had for they wanted to go as far as a station, which was some distance from the city. The gunboats were of little assistance to them, yet notwithstanding this drawback, our boys returned with only a few killed and wounded, and after this we were not troubled with General Finnegan. We remained here a few weeks longer, when, about April 1st, the regiment was ordered back to Camp Saxton, where it stayed a week, when the order came to go to Port Royal Ferry on picket duty. It was a gay day for the boys. By seven o'clock all tents were down, and each company, with a commissary wagon, marched up the shell road, 
which is a beautiful avenue ten or twelve miles out of Beaufort. We arrived at Seabrook at about four o'clock, where our tents were pitched and the men put on duty. We were here a few weeks, when Company E was ordered to Barnwell Plantation for picket duty. Some mornings I would go along the picket line, and I could see the rebels on the opposite side of the river. Sometimes, as they were changing pickets, they would call over to our men and ask for something to eat, or for tobacco, and our men would tell them to come over. Sometimes one or two would desert to us, saying they had no negroes to fight for. Others would shoot across at our picket, but as the river was so wide, there was never any damage done, and the Confederates never attempted to shell us while we were there. I learned to handle a musket very well while in the regiment, and could shoot straight and often hit the target. I assisted in cleaning the guns and used to fire them off to see if the cartridges were dry, before cleaning and reloading each day. I thought this great fun. I was also able to take a gun all apart and put it together again. Between Barnwell and the mainland was Hall Island. I went over there several times with Sergeant King and other comrades. One night there was a stir in camp when it was found that the rebels were trying to cross, and next morning Lieutenant Parker told me he thought they were on Hall Island, so that after that I did not go over again. While planning for the expedition up the Edisto River, Colonel Higginson was a whole night in the water, trying to locate the rebels and where their picket lines were situated. About July, the boys went up the Edisto to destroy a bridge on the Charleston and Savannah Road. This expedition was twenty or more miles into the mainland. Colonel Higginson was wounded in this fight, and the regiment nearly captured. The steamboat John Adams always assisted us carrying soldiers, provisions, etc. She carried several guns and a good gunner, Edward Heron. Henry Batchlot, a relative of mine, was a steward on this boat. There were two smaller boats, Governor Milton and the Enoch Dean, in the fleet, as these could go up the river better than the large ones could. I often went aboard the John Adams. It went with us into Jacksonville, to Cole and Folly Island, and Gunner Heron was always ready to send a shell at the enemy. One night, Companies K and E, on their way to Pocatalago to destroy a battery that was situated down the river, captured several prisoners. The rebels nearly captured Sergeant King, who, as he sprang and caught a reb, fell over an embankment. In falling, he did not release his hold on his prisoner. Although his hip was severely injured, he held fast until some of his comrades came to his aid and pulled them up. These expeditions were very dangerous. Sometimes the men had to go five or ten miles during the night over on the rebel side and capture or destroy whatever they could find. While at Camp Shaw, there was a deserter who came into Beaufort. He was allowed his freedom about the city and was not molested. He remained about the place a little while and returned to the rebels again. On his return to Beaufort a second time, he was held as a spy, tried, and sentenced to death, for he was a traitor. The day he was shot, he was placed on a hearse with his coffin inside. A guard was placed either side of the hearse, and he was driven through the town. All the soldiers and people in town were out, as this was to be a warning to the soldiers. Our regiment was in line on dress parade. They drove with him to the rear of our camp, where he was shot. I shall never forget this scene. While at Camp Shaw, Chaplain Fowler, Robert Defoe, and several of our boys were captured while tapping some telegraph wires. Robert Defoe was confined in the jail at Walterboro, South Carolina, 
for about twenty months. When Sherman's army reached Pocatalago, he made his escape and joined his company, Company G. He had not been paid, as he had refused the reduced pay offered by the government. Before we got to camp, where the payrolls could be made out, he sickened and died of smallpox, and was buried at Savannah, never having been paid one cent for nearly three years of service. He left no heirs, and his account was never settled. In winter, when it was very cold, I would take a mess pan, put a little earth in the bottom, and go to the cook shed and fill it nearly full of coals, carry it back to my tent and put another pan over it, so when the provost guard went through camp after taps, they would not see the light, as it was against the rules to have a light after taps. In this way I was heated and kept very warm. A mess pan is made of sheet iron, something like our roasting pans, only they are nearly as large round as a peck measure, but not so deep. We had fresh beef once in a while, and we would have soup, and the vegetables they put in this soup were dried and pressed. They looked like hops. Salt beef was our standby. Sometimes the men would have what we called slapjacks. This was flour, made into bread and spread thin on the bottom of the mess pan to cook. Each man had one of them, with a pint of tea for his supper, or a pint of tea and five or six hardtack. I often got my own meals, and would fix some dishes for the non-commissioned officers also. Mrs. Chamberlain, our quartermaster's wife, was with us here. She was a beautiful woman. I can see her pleasant face before me now, as she, with Captain Trowbridge, would sit and converse with me in my tent two or three hours at a time. She was also with me on Coal Island, and I think we were the only women with the regiment well there. I remember well how, when she first came into camp, Captain Trowbridge brought her to my tent and introduced her to me. I found her then, as she remained ever after, a lovely person, and I always admired her cordial and friendly ways. Our boys would say to me sometimes, Mrs. King, why is it you are so kind to us? You treat us just as you do the boys in your own company. I replied, Well, you know, all the boys in other companies are the same to me as those in my company E. You are all doing the same duty, and I will do just the same for you. Yes, they would say, we know that, because you were the first woman we saw when we came into camp, and you took an interest in us boys ever since we have been here, and we are very grateful for all you do for us. When at Camp Shaw, I visited the hospital in Beaufort, where I met Clara Barton. There were a number of sick and wounded soldiers there, and I often went to see the comrades. Miss Barton was always very cordial toward me, and I honoured her for her devotion and care of those men. There was a man, John Johnson, who with his family was taken by our regiment at Edisto. This man afterwards worked in the hospital and was well known to Miss Barton. I have been told since that when she went south, in 1883, she tried to look this man up, but learned he was dead. His son is living in Edisto, Reverend J. J. Johnson, and is the president of an industrial school on that island, and a very intelligent man. He was a small child when his father and family were captured by our regiment at Edisto. End of section 5 Section 6 of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor on Morris and other islands. Fort Wagner being only a mile from our camp, I went there two or three times a week, and would go up on the ramparts to watch the gunners send their shells into Charleston, 
which they did every fifteen minutes, and had a full view of the city from that point. Outside of the fort were many skulls lying about. I have often moved them one side out of the path. The comrades and I would have quite a debate as to which side the men fought on. Some thought they were the skulls of our boys. Others thought they were the enemies. But as there was no definite way to know, it was never decided which could lay claim to them. They were a gruesome sight, those fleshless heads and grinning jaws. But by this time I had become accustomed to worse things and did not feel as I might have earlier in my camp life. It seems strange how our aversion to seeing suffering is overcome in war, how we are able to see the most sickening sights, such as men with their limbs blown off and mangled by the deadly shells, without a shudder, and instead of turning away, how we hurry to assist in alleviating their pain, bind up their wounds, and press the cool water to their parched lips, with feelings only of sympathy and pity. About the 1st of June, 1864, the regiment was ordered to Folly Island, staying there until the latter part of the month, when it was ordered to Morris Island. We landed on Morris Island between June and July, 1864. This island was a narrow strip of sandy soil, nothing growing on it but a few bushes and shrubs. The camp was one mile from the boat landing, called Pornell Landing, and the landing one mile from Fort Wagner. Colonel Higginson had left us in May of this year, on account of wounds received at Edisto. All the men were sorry to lose him. They did not want him to go, they loved him so. He was kind and devoted to his men, thoughtful for their comfort, and we missed his genial presence from the camp. The regiment under Colonel Trowbridge did garrison duty, but they had troublesome times from Fort Gregg on James Island, for the rebels would throw a shell over on our island every now and then. Finally, orders were received for the boys to prepare to take Fort Gregg, each man to take 150 rounds of cartridges, canteens of water, hardtack, and salt beef. This order was sent three days prior to starting, to allow them to be in readiness. I helped as many as I could to pack haversacks and cartridge boxes. The fourth day, about five o'clock in the afternoon, the call was sounded, and I heard the first sergeant say, Fall in, boys, fall in, and they were not long obeying the command. Each company marched out of its street, in front of their colonel's headquarters, where they rested for half an hour, as it was not dark enough, and they did not want the enemy to have a chance to spy their movements. At the end of this time, the line was formed with the 103rd New York, white, in the rear, and off they started, eager to get to work. It was quite dark by the time they reached Pornell Landing. I have never forgotten the goodbyes of that day, as they left camp. Colonel Trowbridge said to me as he left, Goodbye, Mrs. King. Take care of yourself if you don't see us again. I went with them as far as the landing, and watched them until they got out of sight, and then I returned to the camp. There was no one at camp but those left on picket, and a few disabled soldiers, and one woman, a friend of mine, Mary Shaw, and it was lonesome and sad, now that the boys were gone, some never to return. Mary Shaw shared my tent that night, and we went to bed, but not to sleep, for the fleas nearly ate us alive. We caught a few, but it did seem, now that the men were gone, that every flea in camp had located my tent, and caused us to vacate. Sleep being out of the question, we sat up the remainder of the night. About four o'clock, July 2nd, the charge was made. The firing could be plainly heard in camp. 
I hastened down to the landing and remained there until eight o'clock that morning. When the wounded arrived, or rather began to arrive, the first one brought in was Samuel Anderson of our company. He was badly wounded. Then others of our boys, some with their legs off, arm gone, foot off, and wounds of all kinds imaginable. They had to wade through creeks and marshes, as they were discovered by the enemy and shelled very badly. A number of the men were lost. Some got fastened in the mud and had to cut off the legs of their pants to free themselves. The 103rd New York suffered the most, as their men were very badly wounded. My work now began. I gave my assistance to try to alleviate their sufferings. I asked the doctor at the hospital what I could get for them to eat. They wanted soup, but that I could not get. But I had a few cans of condensed milk and some turtle eggs, so I thought I would try to make some custard. I had doubts as to my success, for cooking with turtle eggs was something new to me. But the adage has it, nothing ventured, nothing done. So I made a venture and the result was a very delicious custard. This I carried to the men, who enjoyed it very much. My services were given at all times for the comfort of these men. I was on hand to assist whenever needed. I was enrolled as company laundress, but I did very little of it, because I was always busy doing other things through camp and was employed all the time doing something for the officers and comrades. After this fight, the regiment did not return to the camp for one month. They were ordered to Coal Island in September, where they remained until October. About November 1st, 1864, six companies were detailed to go to Greg Landing, Port Royal Ferry, and the rebels in some way found out some of our forces had been removed and gave our boys in camp a hard time of it for several nights. In fact, one night it was thought the boys would have to retreat. The colonel told me to go down to the landing and if they were obliged to retreat, I could go aboard one of our gunboats. One of the gunboats got in the rear and began to shell General Beauregard's forces which helped our boys retain their possession. About November 15th, I received a letter from Sergeant King, saying the boys were still lying three miles from Greg Landing and had not had a fight yet, that the rebels were waiting on them and they on the rebels, and each were holding their own. Also that General Sherman had taken Fort McAllister, eight miles from Savannah. After receiving this letter, I wanted to get to Beaufort, so I could be near to them, and so be able to get news from my husband. November 23rd, I got a pass for Beaufort. I arrived at Hilton Head about three o'clock next day, but there had been a battle, and a steamer arrived with a number of wounded men, so I could not get a transfer to Beaufort. The doctor wished me to remain over until Monday. I did not want to stay. I was anxious to get off, as I knew no one at Hilton Head. I must mention a pet pig we had on Coal Island. Colonel Trowbridge brought it into camp one day, a poor, thin little pig, which a German soldier brought back with him on his return from a furlough. His regiment, the 74th Pennsylvania, was just embarking for the north, where it was ordered to join the 10th Corps, and he could not take the pig back with him, so he gave it to our colonel. That pig grew to be the pet of the camp, and was the special care of the drummer boys, who taught him many tricks, and so well did they train him, that every day at practice and dress parade, his pig ship would march out with them, keeping perfect time with their music. The drummers would often disturb the devotions by riding this pig into the midst of evening praise meeting, and many were the complaints made to the colonel, but he was always very lenient towards the boys, 
for he knew they only did this for mischief. I shall never forget the fun we had in camp with Piggy. End of section six. Section seven of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. Cast away. There was a yacht that carried passengers from Hilton Head to Beaufort. There were also five small boats which carried people over. The only people here, besides the soldiers, were Mrs. Lizzie Brown, who came over on a permit to see her husband, who was at this place and was very ill. He died while she was there. Corporal Walker's wife, with her two years old child, and Mrs. Seabrook. As soon as we could get the yacht, these persons I have mentioned, together with a comrade just discharged, an officer's boy, and myself, took passage on it for Beaufort. It was nearly dark before we had gone any distance, and about eight o'clock we were cast away and were only saved through the mercy of God. I remember going down twice. As I rose the second time, I caught hold of the sail and managed to hold fast. Mrs. Walker held on to her child with one hand, while with the other she managed to hold fast to some part of the boat, and we drifted and shouted as loud as we could, trying to attract the attention of some of the government boats, which were going up and down the river. But it was in vain, we could not make ourselves heard, and just when we gave up all hope, and in the last moment, as we thought, gave one more despairing cry, we were heard at Ladies Island. Two boats were put off and a search was made to locate our distressed boat. They found us at last, nearly dead from exposure. In fact, the poor little baby was dead, although her mother still held her by her clothing with her teeth. The soldier was drowned, having been caught under the sail and pinned down. The rest of us were saved. I had to be carried bodily, as I was thoroughly exhausted. We were given the best attention that we could get at this place where we were picked up. The men who saved us were surprised when they found me among the passengers, as one of them, William Geary, of Darien, Georgia, was a friend of my husband. His mother lived about two miles from where we were picked up, and she told me she had heard cries for a long time that night, and was very uneasy about it. Finally, she said to her son, I think some poor souls are cast away. I don't think so, mother, he replied. I saw some people going down the river today. You know this is Christmas, and they are having a good time. But she still persisted that these were cries of distress, and not of joy, and begged him to go out and see. So, to satisfy her, he went outside and listened, and then he heard them also, and hastened to get the boats off to find us. We were capsized about 8.15pm, and it was near midnight when they found us. Next day, they kept a sharp lookout on the beach for anything that might be washed in from the yacht, and got a trunk and several other things. Had the tide been going out, we should have been carried to sea and lost. I was very ill and under the doctor's care for some time in Beaufort. The doctor said I ought to have been rolled, as I had swallowed so much water. In January 1865, I went back to Coal Island, where I could be attended by my doctor, Dr. Minor, who did all in his power to alleviate my suffering, for I was swollen very much. This he reduced and I recovered, but had a severe cough for a long time afterward. End of section seven. Section eight of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor. A Flag of Truce. In October 1864, 
six companies of the regiment were ordered to Gregg Landing, South Carolina. Captain L. W. Metcalf of Company G was appointed on General Saxton's staff as Provost Captain, Lieutenant James B. West acting as Assistant General. As in some way our mail had been sent over to the Confederate side, and their mail to us, Captain Metcalf and Lieutenant West were detailed to exchange these letters under a flag of truce. So, with an escort of six men of the companies at Port Royal Ferry, the flag was unfurled and the message shouted across the river to the Confederates. Captain Metcalf asked them to come over to our side under the protection of our flag of truce. This the Confederates refused to do, having for their excuse that their boat was too far up the river, and so they had no way to cross the river to us. They asked Metcalf to cross to them. He at once ordered his men to stack arms, the Confederates following suit, and his boys in blue rode him over, and he delivered the message after having introduced himself to the rebel officers. One of these officers was Major Jones of Alabama, the other Lieutenant Scott of South Carolina. Major Jones was very cordial to our captain, but Lieutenant Scott would not extend his hand and stood aside in sullen silence, looking as if he would like to take revenge then and there. Major Jones said to Captain Metcalf, we have no one to fight for. Should I meet you again, I shall not forget we have met before. With this he extended his hand to Metcalf and bade him goodbye, but Lieutenant Scott stood by and looked as cross as he possibly could. The letters were exchanged, but it seemed a mystery just how those letters got missent to the opposite sides. Captain Metcalf said he did not feel a mite comfortable while he was on the Confederate soil. As for his men, you can imagine their thoughts. I asked them how they felt on the other side, and they said, we would have felt much better if we had had our guns with us. It was a little risky, for sometimes the flag of truce is not regarded, but even among the enemy there are some good and loyal persons. Captain Metcalf is still living in Medford. He is 71 years old, and just as loyal to the old flag and the Grand Army of the Republic as he was from 1861 to 1866, when he was mustered out. He was a brave captain, a good officer, and was honored and beloved by all in the regiment. End of section eight. Section 9 of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor Chapter 9 Capture of Charleston On February 28th, 1865, the remainder of the regiment were ordered to Charleston, as there were signs of the rebels evacuating that city. Leaving Coal Island, we arrived in Charleston between nine and ten o'clock in the morning, and found the Rebs had set fire to the city and fled, leaving women and children behind to suffer and perish in the flames. The fire had been burning fiercely for a day and night. When we landed, under a flag of truce, our regiment went to work assisting the citizens in subduing the flames. It was a terrible scene. For three or four days the men fought the fire, saving the property and effects of the people. Yet these white men and women could not tolerate our black Union soldiers, for many of them had formerly been their slaves. And although these brave men risked life and limb to assist them in their distress, men and even women would sneer and molest them whenever they met them. My headquarters assigned me at a residence on South Battery Street, one of the most aristocratic parts of the city, where I assisted in caring for the sick and injured comrades. 
After getting the fire under control, the regiment marched out to the racetrack, where they camped until March 12th, when we were ordered to Savannah, Georgia. We arrived there on the 13th, about 8 o'clock in the evening, and marched out to Fairlong, near the Atlantic and Gulf Railroad, where we remained about 10 days, when we were ordered to Augusta, Georgia, where Captain Alexander Heasley of Company E was shot and killed by a Confederate. After his death, Lieutenant Parker was made captain of the company and was with us until the regiment was mustered out. He often told me about Massachusetts, but I had no thought at that time that I should ever see that state and stand in the cradle of liberty. The regiment remained in Augusta for 30 days when it was ordered to Hamburg, South Carolina, and then on to Charleston. It was while on their march through the country to the latter city that they came in contact with the bushwhackers, as the rebels were called, who hid in the bushes and would shoot the Union boys every chance they got. Other times they would conceal themselves in the cars used to transfer our soldiers. And when our boys, worn out and tired, would fall asleep, these men would come out from their hiding places and cut their throats. Several of our men were killed in this way, but it could not be found out who was committing these murders. Until one night, one of the rebels was caught in the act, trying to cut the throat of a sleeping soldier. He was put under guard, court-martialed, and shot at Wall Hollow. First Lieutenant Jerome T. Furman and a number of soldiers were killed by these South Carolina bushwhackers at Wall Hollow. After this man was shot, however, the regiment marched through unmolested to Charleston. End of section 9 Section 10 of Reminiscences by Susie King Taylor Mustered out. The regiment, under Colonel Trowbridge, reached Charleston in November 1865 and camped on the racetrack until January, when they returned to Morris Island, and on February 9th, 1866, the following general orders were received and the regiment mustered out. They were delighted to go home, but oh, how they hated to part from their commanding chief, Colonel C.T. Trowbridge. He was the very first officer to take charge of black soldiers. We thought there was no one like him, for he was a man among his soldiers. All in the regiment knew him personally, and many were the jokes he used to tell them. I shall never forget his friendship and kindness toward me. From the first time I met him, to the end of the war. There was never anyone from the North who came into our camp, but he would bring them to see me. While on a visit south in 1888, I met a comrade of the regiment, who often said to me, You up North, Mrs. King, do you ever see Colonel Trowbridge? How I should like to see him. I don't see why he does not come south sometime. Why, I would take a day off and look up all the boys I could find, if I knew he was coming. I knew this man meant what he said, for the men of the regiment knew Colonel Trowbridge first of all the other officers. He was with them on St. Simon and at Camp Saxton. I remember when the company was being formed. We wished Captain C.T. was our captain, because most of the men in Company E were men he brought with him from St. Simon and they were attached to him. He was always jolly and pleasing with all. I remember when going into Savannah in 1865, he said that he had been there before the war and told me many things I did not know about the river. Although this was my home, I had never been on it before. No officer in the army was more beloved than our late Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Trowbridge. Copy of General Orders 
General Orders Headquarters, 33rd United States Colored Troops Late 1st South Carolina Volunteers Morris Island, South Carolina February 9th, 1866 General Order Number 1 Comrades, the hour is at hand when we must separate forever and nothing can take from us the pride we feel when we look upon the history of the first South Carolina volunteers, the first black regiment that ever bore arms in defense of freedom on the continent of America. On the ninth day of May, 1862, at which time there were nearly four millions of your race in bondage, sanctioned by the laws of the land and protected by our flag, on that day, in the face of floods of prejudice that well-nigh deluged every avenue to manhood and true liberty, you came forth to do battle for your country and kindred. For long and weary months, without pay or even the privilege of being recognized as soldiers, you labored on, only to be disbanded and sent to your homes without even a hope of reward. And when our country, necessitated by the deadly struggle with armed traitors, finally granted you the opportunity again to come forth in defense of the nation's life. The alacrity with which you responded to the call gave abundant evidence of your readiness to strike a manly blow for the liberty of your race. And from that little band of hopeful, trusting, and brave men who gathered at Camp Saxton on Port Royal Island in the fall of 62. Amidst the terrible prejudices that surrounded us has grown an army of 140,000 black soldiers whose valor and heroism has won for your race a name which will live as long as the undying pages of history shall endure. And by whose efforts, united with those of the white man, Armed rebellion has been conquered, the millions of bondsmen have been emancipated, and the fundamental law of the land has been so altered as to remove forever the possibility of human slavery being established within the borders of redeemed America. The flag of our fathers, restored to its rightful significance, now floats over every foot of our territory from Maine to California, and beholds only free men. The prejudices which formerly existed against you are well nigh rooted out. Soldiers, you have done your duty and acquitted yourselves like men who, actuated by such ennobling motives, could not fail. And as the result of your fidelity and obedience, you have won your freedom, and oh, how great the reward. It seems fitting to me that the last hours of our existence as a regiment should be passed amidst the unmarked graves of your comrades at Fort Wagner. Near you rest the bones of Colonel Shaw, buried by an enemy's hand in the same grave with his black soldiers who fell at his side where in the future your children's children will come on pilgrimages to do homage to the ashes of those who fell in this glorious struggle. The flag which was presented to us by the Reverend George B. Cheever and his congregation of New York City on the 1st of January, 1863, the day when Lincoln's immortal proclamation of freedom was given to the world and which you have borne so nobly through the war, is now to be rolled up forever and deposited in our nation's capital. And while there it shall rest, with the battles in which you have participated inscribed upon its folds, it will be a source of pride to us all to remember that it has never been disgraced by a cowardly faltering in the hour of danger or polluted by a traitor's touch. Now that you are to lay aside your arms, I adjure you, by the associations and history of the past, 
and the love you bear for your liberties, to harbour no feelings of hatred toward your former masters, but to seek in the paths of honesty, virtue, sobriety, and industry, and by a willing obedience to the laws of the land, to grow up to the full stature of American citizens. The church, the schoolhouse, and the right forever to be free are now secured to you, and every prospect before you is full of hope and encouragement. The nation guarantees to you full protection and justice, and will require from you in return that respect for the laws and orderly deportment which will prove to everyone your right to all the privileges of freemen. To the officers of the regiment I would say, your toils are ended, your mission is fulfilled, and we separate forever. The fidelity, patience, and patriotism with which you have discharged your duties to your men and to your country entitle you to a far higher tribute than any words of thankfulness which I can give you from the bottom of my heart. You will find your reward in the proud conviction that the cause for which you have battled so nobly has been crowned with abundant success. Officers and soldiers of the 33rd United States Colored Troops, once the first South Carolina Volunteers, I bid you all farewell. By order of Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Trowbridge, Commanding Regiment, E. W. Hyde, First Lieutenant, 33rd United States Colored Troops, an acting adjutant. I have one of the original copies of these orders still in my possession. My dear friends, do we understand the meaning of war? Do we know or think of that war of 61? No, we do not. Only those brave soldiers, and those who had occasion to be in it, can realize what it was. I can and shall never forget that terrible war until my eyes close in death. The scenes are just as fresh in my mind today as in 61. I see now each scene, the roll call, the drum tap, lights out, the call at night when there was danger from the enemy, the double force of pickets, the cold and rain. How anxious I would be, not knowing what would happen before morning. Many times I would dress, not sure but all would be captured. Other times I would stand at my tent door and try to see what was going on, because night was the time the rebels would try to get into our lines and capture some of the boys. It was mostly at night that our men went out for their scouts, and often had a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the rebels, and although our men came out sometimes with a few killed or wounded, none of them ever were captured. We do not, as the black race, properly appreciate the old veterans, white or black, as we ought to. I know what they went through, especially those black men, for the Confederates had no mercy on them, neither did they show any toward the white Union soldiers. I have seen the terrors of that war. I was the wife of one of those men who did not get a penny for eighteen months for their services, only their rations and clothing. I cannot praise General David Hunter too highly for he was the first man to arm the black man in the beginning of 1862. He had a hard struggle to hold all the southern division, with so few men, so he applied to Congress, but the answer to him was, do not bother us, which was very discouraging. As the general needed more men to protect the islands and do garrison duty, he organized two companies. I look around now and see the comforts that our younger generation enjoy, and think of the blood that was shed to make these comforts possible for them, and see how little some of them appreciate the old soldiers. My heart burns within me 
at this want of appreciation. There are only a few of them left now, so let us all, as the ranks close, take a deeper interest in them. Let the younger generation take an interest also, and remember that it was through the efforts of these veterans that they and we older ones enjoy our liberty today. End of section 10 Chapter 11 of Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor After the War In 1866, the steamers which ran from Savannah to Darien would not take coloured people unless they stayed in a certain part of the boat away from the white people. So some of the coloured citizens and ex-soldiers decided to form a syndicate and buy a steamer of their own. They finally bought a large one of a New York company. It arrived in fine shape, apparently, and made its first trip to Darien. The next trip was to Beaufort. I went on this trip as the pilot, James Cook, was a friend of my family, and I thought I would enjoy the trip, and I did, getting back in safety. The next trip was to go to Florida, but it never reached there, for on the way down, the boat ran upon St. John Bar and went entirely to pieces. They found out afterwards that they had been swindled, as the boat was a condemned one, and the company took advantage of them, and as they carried no insurance on the boat, they lost all the money they had invested in it. The best people of the city expressed great sympathy for them in their loss, as it promised to prove a great investment at first. At the close of the war, my husband and I returned to Savannah, a number of the comrades returning at the same time. A new life was before us now, all the older life left behind. After getting settled, I opened a school at my home on South Broad Street, now called Oglethorpe Avenue, as there was not any public school for Negro children. I had twenty children at my school, and received one dollar a month for each pupil. I also had a few older ones who came at night. There were several other private schools besides mine. Mrs. Lucinda Jackson had one, on the same street I lived on. I taught almost a year, when the Beach Institute opened, which took a number of my scholars, as this was a free school. On September 16th, 1866, my husband, Sergeant King, died, leaving me soon to welcome a little stranger alone. He was a boss carpenter, but being just mustered out of the army, and the prejudice against his race being still too strong to ensure him much work at his trade, he took contracts for unloading vessels, and hired a number of men to assist him. He was much respected by the citizens, and was a general favourite with his associates. In December 1866, I was obliged to give up teaching, but in April 1867, I opened a school in Liberty County, Georgia, and taught there one year. But country life did not agree with me, so I returned to the city, and Mrs. Susie Carrier took charge of my school. On my return to Savannah, I found that the free school had taken all my former pupils, so I opened a night school, where I taught a number of adults. This, together with other things I could get to do, and the assistance of my brother-in-law, supported me. I taught this school until the fall of 1868, when a free night school opened at the Beach Institute, and again my scholars left me to attend this free school. So I had to close my school. I put my baby with my mother, and entered in the employ of a family, where I lived quite a while, but had to leave as the work was too hard. In 1872, I put in a claim for my husband's bounty, and received $100, some of which I put in the Freedmen's Savings Bank. 
in the fall of 1872, I went to work for a very wealthy lady, Mrs. Charles Green, as laundress. In the spring of 1873, Mr. and Mrs. Green came north to Rye Beach for the summer, and as their cook did not care to go so far from home, I went with them in her place. While there, I won a prize for excellent cooking at a fair which the ladies who were summering there had held to raise funds to build an Episcopal church, and Mrs. Green was one of the energetic workers to make this fair a success. And it was a success in every respect, and a tidy sum was netted. I returned south with Mrs. Green, and soon after, she went to Europe. I returned to Boston again in 1874, through the kindness of Mrs. Barnard, a daughter of ex-mayor Otis of Boston. She was accompanied by her husband, Mr. James Barnard, who was an agent for the line of steamers, her six children, the nurse, and myself. We left Savannah on the steamship Seminole, under Captain Matthews, and when we had passed Hatteras some distance, she broke her shaft. The captain had the sails hoisted, and we drifted along, there being a stiff breeze, which was greatly in our favour. Captain Matthews said the nearest point he could make was Cape Henry Light. About noon, Mr. Barnard spied the light, and told the captain if he would give him a boat, and some of the crew, he would row to the light for help. This was done. The boat was manned, and they put off. They made the light. Then they made for Norfolk, which was eight miles from the light, and did not reach the city until eight o'clock that night. Next morning he returned with a tug to tow us into Norfolk for repairs, but the tug was too small to move the steamer, so it went back for more help. But before it returned, a Norfolk steamer, on the way to Boston, stopped to see what was the matter with our steamer. Our trouble was explained to them, and almost all the passengers were transferred to this steamer. Mr. Barnard remained on the steamer, and Mrs. Barnard deciding to remain with him, I went aboard this other steamer with the rest of the passengers. We left them at anchor, waiting for the tugs to return. This accident brought back very vividly the time previous to this, when I was in that other wreck in 1864, and I wondered if they would reach port safe, for it is a terrible thing to be cast away. But on arriving in Boston, about two days later, I was delighted to hear of the arrival of their steamer at T Wharf, with all on board safe. Soon after I got to Boston, I entered the service of Mr. Thomas Smith's family, on Walnut Avenue, Boston Highlands, where I remained until the death of Mrs. Smith. I next lived with Mrs. Gorham Gray, Beacon Street, where I remained until I was married, in 1879, to Russell L. Taylor. In 1880, I had another experience in steamer accidents. Mr. Taylor and I started for New York on the steamer Stonington. We were in bed when, sometime in the night, the Narragansett collided with our boat. I was awakened by the crash. I was in the ladies' cabin. There were about thirty-five or forty others in the cabin. I sprang out of my berth, dressed as quickly as I could, and tried to reach the deck, but we found the cabin door locked, and two men stood outside and would not let us out. About twenty minutes after, they opened the doors, and we went up on deck, and a terrible scene was before us. The Narragansett was on fire, in a bright blaze. The water was lighted as far as one could see, the passengers shrieking, groaning, running about, leaping into the water, panic-stricken. A steamer came to our assistance. They put the life rafts off, and saved a great many from the burning steamer, and picked a number up from the water. 
a colored man saved his wife and child by giving each a chair and having them jump overboard these chairs kept them afloat until they were taken aboard by the life raft the steamer was burned to the water's edge the passengers on board our steamer were transferred to another one and got to new york at 9.30 the next morning. A number of lives were lost in this accident, and the bow of the Stonington was badly damaged. I was thankful for my escape, for I had been in two similar experiences and got off safely, and I have come to the conclusion I shall never have a watery grave. End of section 11 Section 12 of Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor The Women's Relief Corps All this time my interest in the boys in blue had not abated. I was still loyal and true, whether they were black or white. My hands have never left undone anything they could do towards their aid and comfort in the twilight of their lives. In 1886, I helped to organize Corps 67, Women's Relief Corps, auxiliary to the Grand Army of the Republic, and it is a very flourishing corps today. I have been guard, secretary, treasurer for three years, and in 1893, I was made president of this corps, Mrs. Emily Clark being department president this year. In 1896, in response to an order sent out by the Department of Women's Relief Corps to take a census to secure a complete roster of the Union veterans of the War of the Rebellion now residing in Massachusetts, I was allotted to the West End District, which, with the assistance of Mrs. Lizzie L. Johnson, a member of Corps 67 and widow of a soldier of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers, I canvassed with splendid success and found a great many comrades who were not attached to any post in the city or state. In 1898, the Department of Massachusetts Women's Relief Corps gave a grand fair at Music Hall. I made a large quilt of red, white and blue ribbon that made quite a sensation. The quilt was voted for and was awarded to the department president, Mrs. E. L. W. Waterman of Boston. End of section 12. Section 13 of Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor. Thoughts on present conditions. Living here in Boston where the black man is given equal justice, I must say a word on the general treatment of my race, both in the North and South, in this 20th century. I wonder if our white fellow men realize the true sense or meaning of brotherhood. For 200 years we had toiled for them. The War of 1861 came and was ended, and we thought our race was forever freed from bondage and that the two races could live in unity with each other. But when we read almost every day of what is being done to my race by some whites in the South, I sometimes ask, was the war in vain? Has it brought freedom in the full sense of the word? Or has it not made our condition more hopeless? In this land of the free, we are burned tortured and denied a fair trial, murdered for any imaginary wrong conceived in the brain of the negro-hating white man. There is no redress for us from a government which promised to protect all under its flag. It seems a mystery to me. They say, one flag, one nation, one country indivisible. Is this true? Can we say this truthfully, when one race is allowed to burn, hang, and inflict the most horrible torture weekly, monthly, on another? 
no we cannot sing my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty it is hollow mockery the self-land laws are all on the side of the white and they do just as they like to the negro whether in the right or not i do not uphold my race when they do wrong they ought to be punished but the innocent are made to suffer as well as the guilty and i hope the time will hasten when it will be stopped forever let us remember god says he that sheds blood his blood shall be required again i may not live to see it but the time is approaching when the south will again have cause to repent for the blood it has shed of innocent black men for their blood cries out for vengeance for the south still cherishes a hatred toward the blacks although there are some true southern gentlemen left who abhor the stigma brought upon them and feel it very keenly and i hope the day is not far distant when the two races will reside in peace in the southland and we will sing with sincere and truthful hearts my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing i have been in many states and cities and in each i have looked for liberty and justice equal for the black as for the white but it was not until i was within the borders of new england and reached old massachusetts that i found it here is found liberty in the full sense of the word liberty for the stranger within her gates irrespective of race or creed liberty and justice for all we have before us still another problem to solve with the close of the spanish war and on the entrance of the americans into cuba the same conditions confront us as the war of 1861 left the cubans are free but it is a limited freedom for prejudice deep-rooted has been brought to them and a separation made between the white and black cubans a thing that had never existed between them before but today there is the same intense hatred toward the negro in cuba that there is in some parts of this country i helped to furnish and pack boxes to be sent to the soldiers and hospitals during the first part of the spanish war there were black soldiers there too at the battle of san juan hill they were in the front just as brave loyal and true as those other black men who fought for freedom and the right and yet their bravery and faithfulness were reluctantly acknowledged and praise grudgingly given all we ask for is equal justice the same that is accorded to all other races who come to this country of their free will not forced to as we were and are allowed to enjoy every privilege unrestricted while we are denied what is rightfully our own in a country which the labor of our forefathers helped to make what it is one thing i have noticed among my people in the south they have accumulated a large amount of real estate far surpassing the colored owners in the north who seem to let their opportunity slip by them nearly all of brownsville a suburb of savannah is owned by colored people and so it is in a great many other places throughout the state and all that is needed is the protection of the law as citizens in 1867 soon after the death of my father who had served on a gunboat during the war my mother opened a grocery store where she kept general merchandise always on hand these she traded for cash or would exchange for crops of cotton corn or rice which she would ship once a month to f lloyd and company or johnson and jackson in savannah these were colored merchants 
doing business on Bay Street in that city. Mother bought her first property, which contained 10 acres. She next purchased 50 acres of land. Then she had a chance to get a place with 700 acres of land, and she bought this. In 1870, Colonel Hamilton and Major Devendorft of Oswego, New York, came to the town and bought up a tract of land at a place called Doctor Town and started a mill. Mrs. Devendorft heard of my mother and went to see her and persuaded her to come to live with her, assuring her she would be as one of the family. Mother went with her, but after a few months she went to Doctor Town, where she has been since, and now owns the largest settlement there. All trains going to Florida pass her place, just across the Altamaha River. She is well known by both white and black. The people are fond of her and will not allow anyone to harm her. Mr. Devendorft sold out his place in 1880 and went back to New York, where later he died. I read an article which said the ex-Confederate daughters had sent a petition to the managers of the local theatres in Tennessee to prohibit the performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin, claiming it was exaggerated, that is, the treatment of the slaves, and would have a very bad effect on the children who might see the drama. I paused and thought back a few years of the heart-rending scenes I have witnessed. I have seen many times, when I was a mere girl, thirty or forty men, handcuffed, and as many women and children, come every first Tuesday of each month, from Mr. Wiley's trade office to the auction blocks, one of them being situated on Drayton Street and Court Lane, the other on Bryant Street, near the Pulaski House. The route was down our principal street, Bull Street, to the courthouse, which was only a block from where I resided. All the people in those days got all their water from the city pumps, which stood about a block apart throughout the city. The one we used to get water from was opposite the courthouse, on Bull Street. I remember it as if it were yesterday seeing droves of negroes going to be sold, and I often went to look at them, and I could hear the auctioneer very plainly from my house, auctioning these poor people off. Do these confederate daughters ever send petitions to prohibit the atrocious lynchings and wholesale murdering and torture of the negro? Do you ever hear of them fearing this would have a bad effect on the children? Which of these two, the drama, or the present state of affairs, makes a degrading impression upon the minds of our young generation? In my opinion, it is not Uncle Tom's cabin, but it should be the one that has caused the world to cry, shame. It does not seem as if our land is yet civilized. It is like times long past, when rulers and high officers had to flee for their lives, and the negro has been dealt with in the same way since the war, by those he lived with and toiled for two hundred years or more. I do not condemn all the Caucasian race because the negro is badly treated by a few of the race. No, for had it not been for the true whites, assisted by God and the prayers of our forefathers, I should not be here today. There are still good friends to the Negro. Why, there are still thousands that have not bowed to Baal. So it is with us. Man thinks two hundred years is a long time, and it is too, but it is only as a week to God, and in his own time. I know I shall not live to see the day, but it will come. The South will be like the North, and when it comes it will be prized higher than we prize the North today. God is just, 
when he created man he made him in his image and never intended one should misuse the other all men are born free and equal in his sight i am pleased to know at this writing that the officers and comrades of my regiment stand ready to render me assistance whenever required it seems like bread cast upon the water and it has returned after many days when it is most needed i have received letters from some of the comrades since we parted in 1866 with expressions of gratitude and thanks to me for teaching them their first letters one of them peter wagall is a minister in jacksonville florida another is in the government service at washington dc others are in darien and savannah georgia and all are doing well there are many people who do not know what some of the colored women did during the war there were hundreds of them who assisted the union soldiers by hiding them and helping them to escape many were punished for taking food to the prison stockades for the prisoners when i went into savannah in 1865 i was told of one of these stockades which was in the suburbs of the city and they said it was an awful place the union soldiers were in it worse than pigs without any shelter from sun or storm and the colored women would take food there at night and pass it to them through the holes in the fence the soldiers were starving and these women did all they could towards relieving those men although they knew the penalty should they be caught giving them aid others assisted in various ways the union army these things should be kept in history before the people there has never been a greater war in the united states than the one of 1861 where so many lives were lost not men alone but noble women as well let us not forget that terrible war or our brave soldiers who were thrown into andersonville and libby prisons the awful agony they went through and the most brutal treatment they received in those loathsome dens the worst ever given human beings and if the white soldiers were subjected to such treatment what must have been the horrors inflicted on the negro soldiers in their prison pens can we forget those cruelties no though we try to forgive and say no north no south and hope to see it reality before the last comrade passes away end of section 13 section 14 of reminiscences of my life in camp by susie king taylor a visit to louisiana the inevitable always happens on february 3rd 1898 i was called to shreveport louisiana to the bedside of my son who was very ill he was traveling with nickens and company with the lion's bride when he fell ill and had been ill two weeks when they sent to me i tried to have him brought home to boston but they could not send him as he was not able to sit and ride this long distance so on the 6th of february i left boston to go to him i reached cincinnati on the 8th where i took the train for the south i asked a white man standing near before i got my train what car i should take take that one he said pointing to one but that is a smoking car well he replied that is the car for colored people i went to this car and on entering it all my courage failed me i have ridden in many coaches but i was never in such as these i wanted to return home again but when i thought of my sick boy i said well others ride in these cars and i must do likewise 
and tried to be resigned, for I wanted to reach my boy, as I did not know whether I should find him alive. I arrived in Chattanooga at eight o'clock in the evening, where the porter took my baggage to the train, which was to leave for Marion, Mississippi. Soon after I was seated, just before the train pulled out, two tall men with slouch hats on walked through the car and on through the train. Finally, they came back to our car and stopping at my seat said, where are those men who were with you? I did not know to whom they were speaking as there was another woman in the car, so I made no reply. Again, they asked me, standing directly in front of my seat, where are those men who came in with you? Are you speaking to me? I said. Yes, they said. I have not seen any men, I replied. They looked at me a moment, and one of them asked where I was from. I told him Boston. He hesitated a minute, and walked out of our car to the other car. When the conductor came around, I told him what these men had said, and asked him if they allowed persons to enter the car and insult passengers. He only smiled. Later, when the porter came in, I mentioned it to him. He said, Lady, I see you do not belong here. Where are you from? I told him. He said, I have often heard of Massachusetts. I want to see that place. Yes, I said. You can ride there on the cars, and no person would be allowed to speak to you, as those men did to me. He explained that those men were constables, who were in search of a man who had eloped with another man's wife. That is the way they do here. Each morning you can hear of some negro being lynched. And on seeing my surprise, he said, Oh, that is nothing. It is done all the time. We have no rights here. I have been on this road for 15 years and have seen some terrible things. He wanted to know what I was doing down there, and I told him it was only the illness of my son that brought me there. I was a little surprised at the way the poor whites were made to ride on this road. They put them all together by themselves in a car, between the colored people's coach and the first class coach and it looked like the laborer's car used in Boston to carry the different day laborers to and from their work. I got to Marion, Mississippi at two o'clock in the morning, arrived at Vicksburg at noon, and at Shreveport about eight o'clock in the evening, and found my son just recovering from a severe hemorrhage. He was very anxious to come home, and I tried to secure a berth for him on a sleeper but they would not sell me one, and he was not strong enough to travel otherwise. If I could only have gotten him to Cincinnati, I might have brought him home, but as I could not, I was forced to let him remain where he was. It seemed very hard when his father fought to protect the Union, and our flag, and yet his boy was denied, under this same flag, a berth to carry him home to die, because he was a negro. Shreveport is a little town, made up largely of Jews and Germans and a few southerners, the negroes being in the majority. Its sidewalks are sand, except on the main street. Almost all the stores are kept either by the Jews or Germans. They know a stranger in a minute, as the town is small and the citizens know each other, if not personally, their faces are familiar. I went into a jewelry store one day to have a crystal put in my watch, and the attendant remarked, you are a stranger. I asked him how he knew that. He said he had watched me for a week or so. I told him yes, I was a stranger, and from Boston. Oh. I have heard of Boston, he said. You will not find this place like it is there. How do you like this town? Not very well, I replied. I found that the people who had lived in Massachusetts and were settled in Shreveport 
were very cordial to me and glad to see me. There was a man murdered in cold blood for nothing. He was a colored man and a porter in a store in this town. A clerk had left his umbrella at home. It had begun to rain when he started for home and on looking for the umbrella, he could not, of course, find it. He asked the porter if he had seen it. He said, no, he had not. You answer very saucy, said the clerk, and drawing his revolver, he shot the colored man dead. He was taken up the street to an office where he was placed under $1,000 bond for his appearance and released, and that was the end of the case. I was surprised at this, but I was told by several white and colored persons that this was a common occurrence, and the persons were never punished if they were white, but no mercy was shown to the Negroes. I met several comrades, white and colored, there, and noticed that the colored comrades did not wear their buttons. I asked one of them why this was, and was told, should they wear it, they could not get work. Still, some would wear their buttons, in spite of the feeling against it. I met a newsman from New York on the train. He was a veteran, and said that Sherman ought to come back and go into that part of the country. Shreveport is a horrid place when it rains. The earth is red and sticks to your shoes, and it is impossible to keep rubbers on, for the mud pulls them off. Going across the Mississippi River, I was amazed to see how the houses were built, so close to the shore, or else on low land, and when the river rises, it flows into these houses, and must make it very disagreeable and unhealthy for the inmates. After the death of my son, while on my way back to Boston, I came to Clarksdale, one of the stations on the road from Vicksburg. In this town, a Mr. Hancock of New York had a large cotton plantation, and the Chinese intermarry with the blacks. At Clarksdale, I saw a man hanged. It was a terrible sight, and I felt alarmed for my own safety down there. When I reached Memphis, I found conditions of travel much better. The people were mostly Western and Northern here. The cars were nice, but separate for colored persons, until we reached the Ohio River, when the door was opened and the porter passed through, saying, the Ohio River, change to the other car. I thought, what does he mean? We have been riding all this distance in separate cars, and now we are all to sit together. It certainly seemed a peculiar arrangement. Why not let the Negroes, if their appearance and respectability warrant it, be allowed to ride as they do in the North, East, or West? There are others beside the Blacks, in the South and North, that should be put in separate cars while traveling, just as they put my race. Many black people in the South do not wish to be thrown into a car because all are colored, as there are many of their race very objectionable to them, being of an entirely different class. But they have to adapt themselves to the circumstances and ride with them, because they are all Negroes. There is no such division with the whites. Except in one place I saw, the working man and the millionaire ride in the same coaches together. Why not allow the respectable, law-abiding classes of the blacks the same privilege? We hope for better conditions in the future, and feel sure they will come in time, surely if slowly. While in Shreveport, I visited ex-Senator Harper's house. He is a colored man and owns a large business block, besides a fine residence on Caddo Street several good building lots. Another family, the Pages, living on the same street, were quite wealthy, and a large number of colored families owned their homes, and were industrious, refined people. And 
if they were only allowed justice, the South would be the only place for our people to live. We are similar to the children of Israel, who, after many weary years in bondage, were led into that land of promise, there to thrive and be forever free from persecution. And I don't despair, for the book which is our guide through life declares, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hand. What a wonderful revolution! In 1861, the southern papers were full of advertisements for slaves. But now, despite all the hindrances and race problems, my people are striving to attain the full standard of all other races born free in the sight of God, and in a number of instances have succeeded. Justice, we ask, to be citizens of these United States, where so many of our people have shed their blood with their white comrades, that the stars and stripes should never be polluted. End of section 14. Section 15 of Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor Appendix Roster of Survivors of 33rd United States Colored Troops The following are the names of officers and men as near as I have been able to reach. Colonel T. W. Higginson Lieutenant Colonel C. T. Trowbridge Company A, Captain Charles E. Parker, Lieutenant John A. Trowbridge, Lieutenant J. B. West, Ordnance Sergeant Joseph Holden, First Sergeant Joseph Hatton, Second Sergeant William Jackson, Thomas Smith, George Green, Manley Gatter, Paul Jones, Sancho Jenkins, London Bailey, Edmund Mack, Andrew Perry, Morris Williams, James Dawson, Abel Hayward, Company B, Captain William James, Ordnance Sergeant Bob Bowling, Second Sergeant Nathan Hagens, Third Sergeant Cato Wright, 4th Sergeant Frederick Parker 5th Sergeant William Simmons Corporal Monday Stewart Corporal Alec Seymour Corporal Lazarus Fields Corporal Bozen Green Corporal Stephen Wright Corporal Carolina Hagens Corporal Richard Robinson David Hall Edward Houston, Smart Givens, John Mills, Jacob Riley, Frederick Proctor, Benjamin Gordon, Benjamin Mason, Sabe Natiel, Joseph Noyles, Benjamin Mackwell, Thomas Hernandez, Israel Chun, Steplight Gordon, Charles Talbot, Isaac Jenkins, Morris Polite, Robert Freeman, Jacob Watson, Benjamin Manigault, Richard Adams, Mingo Singleton, Tony Chapman, Joseph Noel, Benjamin Gardner, Company C. Captain A. W. Jackson, Second Sergeant Billy Milton, Corporal Peter Wagall, Corporal Henry Abrams, Martin Dixon, Drummer, Roderick Langs, Pfeiffer, Joseph Smith, Solomon Major, John Brown, Bram Strobridge, Robert Truel, Jerry Fields, Paul Fields, William Johnson, Bram Stoved, Robert Mack, 
Samuel Mack, Jack Mack, Simon Gatson, Bob Bolden, James Long, Ordnance Sergeant Frederick Brown, Company D, Sergeant Isaiah Brown, Luke Wright, Dick Haywood, Stephen Murrell, Joseph Halsley, Nathan Haysby, Ordnance Sergeant Robert Godwin, Peter Johnson, Caesar Johnson, Samson Cuthbert, Company E, Captain N. G. Parker, Corporal Jack Salins, Quaker Green, Abram Fuller, Levin Watkins, Peter Chisholm, Scipio Hayward, Paul King, Richard Howard, Esau Kellison, Charles Armstrong, Washington Demry, Benjamin King, Luke Harris, William Cummings. Company F. Captain John Thompson, Sergeant Robert Vandross, Sergeant Caesar Alston, Second Sergeant Moses Green, Corporal Samuel Mack, Edmund Washington, Isaac Jenkins, Charles Seymour, Frank Grayson, Bristow Eddy, Abram Fields, Joseph Richardson, James Brown, Frederick Tripp, Frost Coleman, Paul Coleman, Robert Edward, Milton Edward. Company G, Captain L. W. Metcalf, Sergeant T. W. Long, Corporal Prince Logan, Corporal Mark Clark, Corporal James Ash, Corporal Henry Hamilton, Roderick Long, Benjamin Turner, David Wanton, Benjamin Martin, John Riles, Charles Williams, Hogarth Williams, Benjamin Wright, Henry Harker, Company H, Captain W. W. Sampson, First Sergeant Jacob Jones, Second Sergeant Thomas Fields, Corporal A. Brown, Corporal Emmanuel Washington, Jackson Danner, Joseph Wright, Phillips Brown, Luke Harris, Lazarus Aikens, Jonah Aikens, Jacob Jones, Thomas Howard, William Williams, Jack Parker, Jack Ladson, Paul McKee, Lucius Baker, Company I, Second Sergeant Daniel Spaulding, Corporal Luan Dick Pay, Corporal Floward, Corporal Thompson, Company K, Ordnance Sergeant Harry Williams, Second Sergeant Billy Coleman, Third Sergeant Caesar Austin, Jacob Lance, Jack Burns, William McLean, George Washington, David Wright, Jerry Mitchell, Jackson Green, David Putnam, B. Lance, Ward McKen, Edmund Cloud, Chance Mitchell, Leon Simmons, Prince White, Stephen Jenkins, Quartermaster Harry West, Quartermaster Sergeant Edward Colvin. A list of the battles fought by the 33rd United States Colored Troops, formerly 1st South Carolina Volunteers. Darien, Georgia and Ridge, 1862. 
St. Mary's River and Hundred Pines, 1862. Pocatalago Bridge, 1862. Note, many prisoners and stores captured. Jacksonville, Florida, 1863. Township, 1863. Milltown Bluff, 1863. Note, four prisoners captured. Hall Island, 1863. Johns Island, 1863. Kusaw River, 1863. Kambahi and Edisto, 1863. Note, 300 prisoners captured. James Island, 1864. Note, Fort Gregg captured. Honey Hill, 1864. End of section 15. And end of Reminiscences of My Life in Camp by Susie King Taylor. Thank you for listening.